That is Paul Messier. He's making a speech and presentation at the Library of Congress. Mr. Messier is an important part of our story. As a young photography conservator, he cracked the Lewis Hine case. Can we start off with background about yourself? Sure. What do you want to know? <laughs> well, how did how did you get into photographs? What education did you have? And, and the jobs and occupations in between? Okay. Yeah, sure. And I'm happy to send you my CV, which will put you right to sleep, but you'll have everything there. So, yeah, I, I have a, my undergraduate degree is in art history, and I had kind of a minor in fine arts. And with those two combined, I was you know, definitely looking for a profession that kind of had those two components. Discovered the, uh, the field of art conservation, which has a heavy component in, in the fine arts, obviously, and, and art history, but also sciences. Picked up uh, science after, you know, the science uh, that I needed, mostly chemistry, after I got my undergraduate degree. And then uh, worked as an apprentice, uh, which is very common in the, in the conservation field. And the guy that I worked with was one of the earliest photograph conservator practitioners in the, in the United States. His name was Jose Araca, and I was pretty much a, a, a snob coming out of my undergraduate. I didn't think photography was art. I, I thought, you know, I, I, I had everything to learn about photography. And I started um, in his studio in 1985. In fact, I met Walter Rosenblum during a visit that Walter paid to, to Jose. I must have been 1985, 86, something like that. And uh, from that apprenticeship experience, I managed to get myself into graduate school for conservation. One of the great programs is in Buffalo, New York. I, I went to the Buffalo program in art conservation. I did a fellowship after that. It's kind of the capstone year of that program. You go and you do um, internships outside of the program. So I spent a year working for the municipal collections in Paris, working as a photograph conservator. After graduate school, I started doing some conservation-related research with another fellowship at the Smithsonian. When that was finished, after a year, I went to um, a regional conservation center, a sort of it's a nonprofit conservation center, which was based in Denver, Colorado. That was my first like job, actually, in conservation. Um, did that for a couple of years, came back to Boston. I'm from the Boston area. Um, always wanted to come back. Came back and started a, a private conservation practice. And that was in 1994. The practice was still sort of in its fledgling state, fledgling years, when a client, Michael Mattis, approached me with behind, I think that must have been in, um, I mean, it all broke in 99. I'm pretty sure that's right. And I think we probably started working on it in the mid to late winter of 99. I kind of remember February sticking in my mind as kind of when this all started going down. So that's the that's that's it. That's in a nutshell. That's it. And, oh, and so from there, you know, my private practice, it still exists. It's still in Boston that, you know, it gainfully employs Greek conservators. But really, I started doing more and more research. Hein was a catalyst, but certainly the, the work that I've done earlier at the Smithsonian, that was, you know, really a fascinating experience and formative. And that became more and more a part of my identity until, um, you know, it really kind of took over. And uh, I, you know, w when I had the opportunity to, to establish this lab, to found this lab, the Lens Media Lab at Yale, I, you know, I jumped for it. And so that lab has been up and running since uh, 2015. That lab is within something called the Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage at, at Yale. And as of beginning of 2020, I was appointed chair of that institute. Paul, it seems that you skipped over statistics, and I've, I've seen your videos now. I've read some articles about you, and statistics have been a big import to you and your work. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing, amazing modeling. So did you get that from undergrad? Did you teach yourself? Did uh, how uh, Yeah, no, that's, I'm pretty much, I'm, I'm you know, pretty much a self-taught when it comes to the statistical side, when it comes to the data visualization side, when it comes to structuring data and databases, some of it's, you know, sort of 
intuitive for me, I guess, a little bit, but most of it's self-taught. And I have to say, you know, one of the big motivations for starting the lab at, at Yale was to kind of get out of the, the sort of amateur business of, of that um, and, and really professionalize it. And so the lab now is a data scientist and some signal processing people, and we've really taken it to the next level. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the people that are doing it now for me in the lab, I mean, they, they really know what they're doing, and they make me look like a total piker. So. <laughs> well, uh, before we get too far into uh, the Hein issue, I wanted to ask you, Mr. Messier, about what your current outside of Yale business involves. Is it mostly restoration? Is it mostly authentication? Is it all of that or more? Yeah, it's pretty much a combination. I mean, it, the way it breaks out is about a third, a third, a third, you know, and it's been stable like this for a long time. So, you know, one third is just kind of um, bread and butter conservation treatments. And, and, and that's for collectors, auction houses, galleries, that kind of thing. The other third is kind of consultation sort of services where thinking about preservation planning and integrating kind of good conservation practices around photography. And so that's kind of a more of a consultancy sort of piece. And then the other third, I guess, would be, we don't really call it authentication services because I never, you know, I, I feel like, I feel pretty strongly, in fact, that I'm not part of, that I'm part of a, of a team and authentication is, is a really a, you know, it's just, it's just not, it's not central to what my contribution is, you know, to say something is real or it's not real or it's, you know, that, that can be a very nuanced thing. So what we call it basically is materials analysis. I got so, you. you know, so we try to make it a little more generic and we say, based on our research and the data that we have access to, we think that this object is most consistent with this period of production. Gotcha. So I, I never say, oh, Lewis Hine died in 1940, and here's the paper results that say 1980. Yeah. It, it's a fake. Um, <laughs> I, I, I write it up so, you know, it's it's clear what the data is, is leading to, and I leave it up to, to others to decide whether it's a, a fake, a fraud, a misattribution, a, you know, it could be a whole other yeah. list of plausible explanations. I don't get into that. I just I just sort of say this is where the data points. This is what the media the data on the media points to. Yeah, I, I understand yeah. exactly what you're saying. And yeah. and even for paintings, the what the little bit I've studied in the area, um, yeah. the authentication process is pretty multidisciplinary. Uh, exactly, exactly. And and you know, and you never know how something was represented at the time of, of a transaction of a sale, you just, and, and so, anyway, I mean, in photography, posthumous printing is not that uncommon, and as long as it's identified as such, I think people don't really have a problem with it, as long as you know what you've got, right, right, who made it, who made it, and when, it's not unacceptable practice. Before we dive again into the Lewis Hine issue, I wanted to, to ask you about this. Uh, this was uh, an issue that came up in my mind a couple days ago when I was thinking about you, and that's that every day photographs are getting older, and there has, there has to be a yardstick where you know they just start deteriorating. And then I saw your video about how to measure the pixel loss during an exhibition of daguerreotypes, and I oh, thought, Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! How did you find that? Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> and I thought, Well, that's just it right there. He's already producing work on that issue. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, we, we have these really powerful tools, you know, we have this amazing capacity to do imaging and, and make that imaging repeatable, you know, so instead of just taking pictures, we're taking pictures, but we're also making data if we, if we approach it in the, in the correct way. And if you have sort of this data as a baseline and, and you know exactly how you made it and you know that you can repeat that, well, then you can compare on a pixel level the extent of the extent of change. Yeah. So yeah, and so that's what that 
Yeah, that's what that talk was about. And that's what that project was about. And so, so you can figure out how best to restore and or conserve what you have. Is that? Yeah, I mean, that's fundamentally it. Um, but, you know, every, every object doesn't matter if it's an art object or uh, literally everything on the planet is interacting with its environment. We don't like to think of it necessarily for works of art. We tend to think that there's like a, they're static. But no, nothing is static. Everything is constantly interacting with the environment. And so, you know, one of the things that we think about is how is that exchange, that, that interaction impacting the object? And if it's impacting it in an adverse way, especially long term, how can we intervene as, as minimally as possible to kind of minimize the, those adverse interactions? I don't know if that makes any sense at all, but that's, you know, that's one way to, to kind of look at the preservation challenge. It, it, makes, it makes perfect sense, and I want to take it one step further because uh, even though, uh, you know, I don't want to waste your time on this, but it's very interesting to me, and that's that thinking, uh, you know, not just generations ahead, but thousands and thousands of years ahead, if you yeah. have a data set that explains exactly what's in your museum, even if it deteriorates, it can be recreated. Well, yeah, I mean, that's it, absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, that's, there's, and there are a lot of initiatives that are thinking about, you know, that kind of migration from the analog world <laughs> into the digital world as a preservation method. But, you know, there's one sort of note of, of caution, right? And this is, this is kind of, a, this is pretty relevant, actually, with, like, the Lewis Hine thing, you know, because... Because, I mean, a lot of people think, well, why, why would you want to preserve a photograph, right? A photograph, what's a photograph? It's just an image. So make a digital copy, and, and, that's, and you're done, right? But, but no, I mean, we understand that these, that these objects have, uh, you know, what, that, well, first of all, that they're objects. They occupy space, and they are these, these physical tethers to an artist, the moment of creation. And that these objects have value, have intrinsic value beyond just the image. The object has has this has this cultural value, and that's that's where you know things kind of ran off the rails, I guess, a little bit with the Lewis Hine thing. Was you know did the were these objects were these prints? They were you know the the market wasn't paying a lot of money for Lewis Hine images. They were paying a lot of money. <laughs> the, the payments were not for images, they were for objects, they were for things. And those things... That he touched, were, that he might have yeah, touched. Yeah, exactly. Purportedly were made by Lewis Hine. And, and that was, that's, there's, there's, a, there's market value there, but there's a lot of cultural value there. And that's where, you know, I think that there's a, you know, there's a higher plane to, to these kind of questions. It's not just, you know, the sort of salacious aspects of, of, the, of the case, you know, but there's a, there's a greater principle here of, are, you know, are these objects authentic representations of something that Lewis, Hine, that Lewis Hine or any other artist, you know, if we're talking more broadly, would have made? Is the connection that we have when we look at them in a museum collection on the wall is the connection that's being made between the viewer and the artist, is that real? Is that reliable? And that's, that's pretty fundamental. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've already step, stepped your toe into uh, the waters. <laughs> <laughs> so let's jump yeah. in. Uh, yeah, let's jump in. Yeah, and, okay. and you mentioned earlier a little bit about the, uh, the Hine investigation. And yeah. uh, what I want to ask you about is, uh, so Dr. Mattis, Dr. Hochberg, they... Mm -hmm contacted you and said, uh, look at these, tell us what you can see? Yeah, basically, so it was, um, you know, Michael Mattis, and he was at that time working together quite a bit with Andy Smith. I don't know if that's a name that you've come across, but Andy, Andy is a dealer in uh, uh, New Mexico. And uh, yeah, so Michael, principally it was Michael, but Andy was right there, put together... I, you know, I basically I said to them, you know, I, if I looked at one, okay, that maybe I come up with something, but I really, I, I really need a group because I, I want to see if there are any sort of patterns that repeat across the group. 
because that that would carry a lot more weight. So they put together, oh, I don't even know. I mean, you've probably seen the report if you've got the FBI file. So they put together that group. I think maybe it was 8 to 15. I don't even quite remember. I have to look at it. But, um, yeah, so that initial group was the, was the group that very rapidly came together through Michael and Andy Smith. So they just FedEx the photographs to you? Yep, and- yep, just can't, yep, and that was ordinary. It still is ordinary most of the time. Yep, everything comes via FedEx. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. Well, it has to. It definitely has to. I mean, that's, yep, that's just the way the world works. Yep. Okay, and, and uh, reading the FBI file, uh, the, the, I know this sounds strange, but the immediate thought that came to my mind was, you must have Batman's cave there because you've got a bat chrom- chromatograph, a bat spectrograph, a bat multi-analyzer, and all the technique. <laughs> How did you de- develop all these techniques? Well, I mean, it was pretty simple at the very beginning. Cause, and this is all kind of incorporated in your art conservation training, is, is kind of knowing what techniques are out there and knowing when to apply them and, and all of that. And so I didn't have a lot of gear, um, nor did I have a lot of expertise in the different analytical techniques, but I had a generalist understanding of what tools I needed and what expertise I needed. And so... You know, I just kind of built around that. Had you already started your paper stock collection, or no, or, or, no, and, I, and actually, that was that that came directly out of the work on the Lewis Hine material. So I didn't even have I didn't have a reference collection then. I didn't have a reference baseline, and I immediately understood that such a baseline was was a was a critical need for the field. And you know, I just started building that gradually. Probably the main question I was asked to look into was what happened to the case? Why didn't yeah. they prosecute uh, Walter Rosenblum for, for forgery or fraud? And yeah. what I think I believe at this point is that your scientific approach, that culmination of all your observations, was such a large meteor of evidence that landed smack on uh, Mr. Rosenblum, he realized that he had to settle. Uh-huh. He had to uh, avoid trial at all costs, and he did that by settling with the uh, alleged victims. Right. Now, right. does that make sense? Well, yes and no. I mean, I've not seen the FBI file, and so I don't know what they were thinking. I'd love to see it at some point. <laughs> but, you know, when it comes to the, to the physical evidence, I mean, there, was, there really was no... There was really no ambiguity about that. There See, was no argument and about this, And this is that. where I want to interrupt you because as yeah. a, a lawyer in a previous existence, I can tell you this. If I had seen that on behalf of my client, the defendant, I would have yeah. said, we have to plead, you're guilty. Yeah. Uh, and, right. and, and so right. let's let's do that. As, as far as the, the reason the FBI didn't continue prosecution, based on my experience as an attorney, uh, they love to let private parties settle the differences and if they can stay out of it they will again rosenblum also was a war hero taking the photographs there at at, on d-day and uh, a a respected professor i can see where they can decide you know hey uh, no harm no foul the parties are satisfied and the other parties unlike dr mattis and dr hochberg they were so satisfied they agreed to uh covenant not to say anything about what happened okay paul yep i'm in all set fantastic uh one thing that i wanted to note first off is that at least one of the photographs that that was asked by uh dr mattis and dr hochberg to be uh evaluated by you had purported signature from lewis hine on the paper and the paper was actually established by you to have been manufactured after the photographer's death yeah. Have you been able to go through the FBI file that I emailed to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I looked at it for sure, but, you know, I, I didn't go through it in great detail because, just like you said, I had written most of that stuff. So. 
So it was like, you know, it was like revisiting a, a, a chapter in my life. But yes, but I, yeah, I, I, I looked at it and I'm generally familiar with pretty much everything that's in that file. But it was great that you sent it, by the way, because now I know what was in it. You know, that's cool. I didn't know that before. Yeah, and yeah, it was extremely cool to get it in the first place because sometimes I don't get what I ask the FBI to give me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I can't imagine. But anyways, uh, when I mentioned earlier that I thought your investigation fell like a meteor upon the Rosenblums, I think that all of it was uh, intrinsic to that belief that I have. But the fact that there's a signature on paper that could not have existed at the time of his life is like the biggest part of that meteor. Is that how you would see it? Well, yeah, I mean, I, and I don't know all of the, the nuances of how those prints were presented to buyers, but I think all you have to do is ask um, Michael Mattis or Andy Smith or, or, or any of the people that, that bought them. I mean, they thought they were buying genuine prints. And so when you have, you know, new paper and an artist's signature, it does imply strongly, I think, that there was an intention to deceive by making those prints and putting them on the market. Right. Another question I have for you, uh, Paul, is has the detection of forgeries in the photography world developed, uh, cough, cough, since the time, <laughs> since the time of the hind forgeries? Yeah, I mean, quite a bit, quite a bit. I mean, I think the first thing is a consciousness that the photography market isn't immune to fakes and frauds. So I think that was a major step. This was among the first big authenticity scandals. There was a Man Ray scandal that was happening almost concurrently with this one. And there have been some others, but this was kind of a, a, a shot over the bow for um, curators, collectors, dealers, that these kind of practices, you know, the, the, the creation of, of frauds, it wasn't just for the paintings market, or it wasn't just for the, for the uh, prints and drawings. I mean, it, was, it could happen in the photography market too. So that was a major step. I think the second, uh, another major step was um, conservators, you know, people like me, started thinking more and more about basic characterization of photographic prints. How do you create and structure data? around the life's work of a photographer. For particular photographers, what's their approach to the medium, the physical aspects of the medium, papers in particular? And that's where the, um, the paper collection comes in, you know, that, that collection that I put together over 20 or so years, and it's now, yeah, I mean, that, that really is a, a new development that came straight out of the scandal, and it's a, it's a scholarly resource now. It's a it serves to preserve the, the physical history of the medium, the material history of photography, but it also serves as a reference point, a baseline, to make those kind of distinctions that you, that you were talking about, like, well, how can you prove that this paper was made in the 80s versus the 1920s? Well, I mean, one of the ways is you can, you can go into the paper collection and you can get several hundred examples of papers made in the 1920s versus the 1980s and you can see how they're physically different right chemically and chemically different right so that's a you know i think that's a very major kind of innovation and yeah and we're always you know there's always a spy versus spy component to all of this you know as you get better tools sometimes the techniques the, the forgery techniques become more refined and all of that so there's we haven't eradicated the potential for for fake forgeries that's for sure but yeah i mean we've got a lot more tools now than we had maybe 20 years ago let me move on to another question yeah. uh yeah. And, and that's uh are you still available to evaluate or authenticate photographs yeah i'm definitely available to consult on you know, authenticity investigations. You know, I, like I said last week, I, I, I don't really fancy myself or, or, or I don't really characterize my work as authentication as much as it is kind of the material analysis that goes into um, a larger uh, uh, authentication study. I think provenance is a huge component um, and that kind of research is kind of, you know, is beyond my scope. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. If, if people have questions about where a print falls 
in terms of the material history of 20th century photography, I've got, I definitely have tools to do that. It's not so much in my capacity as a, as a researcher and lab head at Yale, so this, these would typically be private consultations. And certainly, the people who are working in my studio now, today, you know, they have these capabilities as well, and sometimes I don't, don't even necessarily have to be involved. Right. What would you suggest that a vintage photograph collector have in his or her toolkit to detect obvious forgeries? That's a good question. I think the first thing is a, is a network of experts. Knowing who to ask is really the key. Knowing, you know, experts, if you're thinking of collecting an Edward Weston, for example, who out there knows more about Edward Weston than anybody else, and, and have that person in your network. I think that's... that. The, the network of expertise, I think, is the most powerful tool that any collector can have. When it comes to sort of, you know, physical tools, you know, for a long time now, people have been going into auction houses and galleries and all that with a, with a black light, with a UV source, looking for optical brighteners. Um, I, I've got some questions about that because it sometimes can be very difficult to determine whether something has optical brighteners or not. So there's an interpretation piece that, if you don't have training or experience, can be kind of difficult to master. The other component of, of that is, well, you know, it's not optical brighteners, yes or no, it's, it's, it's only one part of the equation. And there were papers that were made after the, the late 1950s when optical brighteners were introduced. There were papers you know, a significant minority of papers made after that point that don't incorporate optical brighteners at all. So I think, you know, in terms of the toolkit, a UVA source can be helpful if used correctly and used safely. You should definitely wear eye protection to filter out the UV so it's not just streaming into your eyes, especially as it would in a dark room. I think you can get some information there as a collector, but I really feel strongly that thinking critically and having don't go it alone kind of idea. You know, think critically. If it looks too good to be true, it, it may in fact be too good to be true. Know what questions to ask and know who to ask those questions to. Build those ties, build those networks of experts. You know, I have to admit, it makes a lot of sense. And I have to also admit that it was surprising to me, which it shouldn't have been because it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> you know, so well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, very, it's a very nuanced field. You know, I mean, it's, there's a lot that goes into it. And um, I don't think anybody should and can claim ultimate expertise. Like, I am the ultimate expert in XYZ. Uh, if you if you start hearing that kind of stuff, I mean that that's sort of a, a, a red flag that maybe it's a little bit of snake oil. Because <laughs> we're, I mean we're learning so much every single day, every day. You know, I work with the collection, I learn something new. Yeah. And so that's just that's just an illustration. <laughs> of, you know, even though maybe. <laughs> Maybe, you know, 20th century photography is a closed set at this point. There's still so much to learn. Yeah. I mean, that just reminded me of somebody who would come from another lawyer because they were uh, unhappy with their services, and, the, and they would say that that lawyer said that they were the world's foremost and, or whatever. And you're right. That is kind of a hint that maybe you're not getting exactly what your lawyer is projecting. <laughs> yeah, so that, that critical thinking piece is the, is the key. What stops somebody from buying up old stock paper and creating supposedly lifetime photographs? Yeah, well, of course, that's a technique from other forgeries, right? I mean, that works on paper in particular. I mean, that's the textbook step number one is to acquire old paper. In photography, it, it kind of works the same way, but there are some significant caveats. So photography, photographic paper, you know, obviously it's manufactured to be light sensitive. And that light sensitivity changes significantly over time, interaction with the environment. So let's say you knew that, um, oh, I don't know, you know, uh, Edward Weston was using a certain paper um, in the 1940s, and you were able to find that paper, that exact paper, on eBay in an unopened package. 
and if you know somehow if you got the negative or a negative or something, you you were able to come up with some kind of a negative that you could print and make it credible. Well, it's good luck. I mean, good luck. I mean, it's that that paper is going to behave unpredictably. The image that you render is probably not going to look anything like another Edward Weston out there, even even if it's on the same paper. There would be deterioration characteristics, fogging perhaps. It's just it's just not going to behave predictably. There was a study some time ago at the um, at that time it was the George Eastman House by some research fellows there, and they were able to make some fairly successful prints out of older papers. But I don't think any of the results would have passed on the market with people who were aware of of the artists work over a lifetime. If it's Edward Weston, for example, mm-hmm. there's deep expertise in the way Edward Weston is supposed to look. You get back to your network of experts. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's I think it's a it's a challenge. I don't know if you know the Crespi Le Prince scandal. Uh, that was something that uh, is going on. Well, it's, it's, it's resolving now in the French courts, but that was an instance of photographs purporting to be from the 1840s, so very early photographs, uh, 1840s, 1850s, I think, that were supposedly discovered in, in France, in Normandy. They were attributed to this artist, Crespi Le Prince, who was noted as a painter and a lithographer, and all of those were made on old paper. And that was one of the more challenging aspects of researching those because the paper pretty much added up in terms of the date. So in the 19th century, it's different. You know, you don't have these industrially applied emulsion right, uh, right. Uh, and surfaces. So you're kind of doing darkroom chemistry. You know, in your kitchen sink, you could do it potentially, right? And for 20th century material, it becomes a little more, becomes a much higher bar technique. Huh. Of course, I went on eBay to look up old stock paper. Couldn't find much. In fact, the the only thing I found was, and this might have been just a timing or coincidence issue, but the only thing that I found was a a kid's photographic kit. It was from like the 40s. And and I looked through the, the listing and it had, I even was able to enlarge the photographic paper and it said commercial paper on it. So it looked like you could get commercial paper. It was probably crap. But at least there was something out there that would have, you know, if I were a criminal and I wanted to make sure that it would it would date back to that time, there was something there. Not good, but it was there. Yeah. Yeah, just as a side note, there are artists out there, um, Alison Rossiter is a name that comes to mind, who as part of their art, as part of their photography, they will buy old papers and they will repurpose those old papers to make images. And for Alison Rossiter's work, anyway, part of that encounter is this sort of surprise, you know, is the sort of you know, she integrates the, the aging of the papers and the unpredictability of their response into her work. It's kind of cool. You might, you might enjoy checking it out. Well, I will. Uh, yeah. the, the, the other thing that I saw on eBay, and I hate to go back to eBay, but I'm back there now with you. And we're, yeah. we're looking on eBay. We're looking at daguerreotypes, and yeah. there's eight for $40.99. Yeah. What, what, Paul, what takes, what keeps somebody from buying the eight for $40.99 with all these schlocky photographs of old timey folks, uh, chemically or mechanically removing the photograph and then using the old plate in the frame or case or whatever that is. So is that something that you have to worry about? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, that's all practical. Um, that's all possible. You know, a daguerreotype image is, it's, a, it's an incredibly delicate surface, and the idea of maybe buffing out that image and then repurposing that plate, I mean, it's, it's, it's not only is it possible, people have done it. I've not seen that, knock on wood, I've not seen that as a, as a technique to deceive. I, I wouldn't say it's not out there, daguerreotypes are not my particular area of expertise. But, you know, again, there's a, there is this degree of difficulty um, aspect of working with older materials. They, they don't 
behave all that predictably. And so I would imagine that there are some real technical challenges to, to doing that work. But in theory, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a perfectly plausible scenario. Right. I also wanted to mention, from having watched one of your uh, videos about the digital fingerprints, these digital fig- fingerprints seem to me to be microscopic images of the patterns that the paper fibers make. And, you know, I looked at them and, and, and it sure does seem like they, that each paper is a lot different. And, and uh, I know you have categories of rough and, uh, sure. and, and so on, but can you tell us about that a little bit? Well, yeah. I mean, if you think about just any piece of paper, it doesn't have to be a photograph. If you put it under the microscope, there's a network of fibers. And that network of fibers, if, you just, if you're looking at one spot, and you're looking at that one spot consistently across multiple, multiple papers, let's say you're, you know, you're thinking about prints made by a certain artist, right? And, and each, each paper from a macro level will be the same. You, you won't see any difference. You won't see any texture difference. But if you look at a single area on those papers under the microscope, that fiber network will be distinct. It will be absolutely unique. And if you can document that in a consistent sort of repeatable way, you've now, yeah, you've now got a fingerprint for that object without any sort of, you know, heavy intervention associating some chip or, you know, some metal tag or something like that, detectable by XRF. Well, you don't need to do any of that. I mean, these patterns, these fiber patterns are absolutely 100% individual. And creating an index of them, database of them would effectively be an authentication scheme, perhaps, or, you know, if you're an artist at stage or something like that, you would have an index, not just of the image, but you would have an index of the materials. Right. That's the kind of thinking that is starting to catch on a little bit more, Mm -hmm. is um, taking advantage of these material-based, unique characteristics and build out databases of those. Yeah, what I say, or what I'm thinking, at least with this project, is what would a thief, a forger, what would they do? And they wouldn't go so far as to copy the microscopic fingerprints of paper, because that's just going too far and it would be impossible. It's impossible, yeah. Unless unless they bought the facility, and for some reason the facility is still around from the 1940s with the press and everything else, then they could build it from scratch. But they're not going to go through that effort. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, there's uh, obviously, you know, in the news there's been a lot of uh, press and uh, blockchain and all of that, and these ideas are coming into the art world to kind of guarantee provenance. You know, the, the, right. the, the history of an object from the moment it left the artist's hands to through different collectors, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, maybe blockchain plays a role in some of these ideas. But certainly, you can't sort of build uh, kind of data science models without data. And so to record some of these unique characteristics for the purposes of authentication, if you were an artist's estate, for example, I mean, to me, it just, you know, it makes, it makes some sense, especially since it can be done very rapidly right? and, and not very expensively. Okay. Well, I want to jump ship here to uh, a, yeah. another uh, topic and ask you, I understand that you're still doing uh, conservation of photographs, and that's also a topic that's interesting to me with your private company. So what does that entail? So I'm doing that work less and less, I have to admit. Um, and one of the reasons is, you know, I've got a really talented team back in Boston whose work is actually better than mine at this point. So, yeah, I, what does it entail? So, um, yeah, the conservation treatment of a photograph is, you know, it's this sort of uh, delicate balance between intervention, because, I mean, you know, clearly if there's something wrong, if there's a deterioration, if there's ongoing deterioration, I mean, our, our principal task is to try to understand that from a chemical standpoint and then mitigate that. But the market being the way it is, it, it can penalize a print, um, yes, based on condition, but also based on whether it's been conserved or not. 
Okay, and, yeah. You know, and so people are, for us, it's all about getting that calibration right. Making sure that the work that we do not only, you know, benefits the object from a, from a, a physical and chemical point of view, but also it can still go out and function in the marketplace. Oh, like the person on the Antiques Roadshow who buffed out yeah, uh, right, the beautiful right. antique and the expert right. just pulls his or her hair out and said, what did right. you do that for? Right. Uh, let me ask yeah. you this. Let me, Paul, yeah. I'm going to interrupt here because uh, right. th sure. this is an exciting idea for me, and, and that's that you have to worry about the photograph's ultimate deterioration because of this chemical process that you see and are documenting, but there's a current value of the photograph based on this deterioration. So is that what you have to work with with your clients? Yes, and that's like the biggest thing. I mean, it's really, I think the, the biggest part of our jobs as conservators is really communicating with clients with owners, whether they're curators, art historians, you know, collectors, auction houses, gallery owners, and really setting the expectations and calibrating them correctly. Because, you know, here again, we have to listen. Our first job really is to listen, to figure out what the goals of the treatment are, what's possible. In most cases, the owner is really the expert about how that object needs to function for them the sort of performative aspects of that object. Right. And so we have to understand how does that object, what's the context that that object is going to perform in? Is it going up for auction or is it just going to be on the wall in a collector's house? So, or something that they want to pass on to their children and their children's right. children. Right. And so in that case, you know, the needle might point towards maybe a little heavier intervention if it buys you back greater long-term stability. Right, so that's the thing is to you know to there's no one size fits all as you can guess you know it, it's the needle points in sort of different directions and we just have to understand how our work is going to not only enhance the preservation characteristics but enhance the presentation of the object in its specific context. Yeah, it's a balance always, and it's a listening. Well, you, um, for do, the most part. As far as the conservation, does that also include restoration in some cases? Yeah, so kind of the simplest uh, example of kind of restoration. So the, the difference between conservation and restoration, restoration is maybe a subset of conservation work. So conservation is, is principally focused on physical and chemical stability trying to get back to a, you know, to a stable state. And, and yeah. since you do a lot of consulting with museums, they've purchased or they've acquired these beautiful prime exhibits of that, of that type of art, of that type of photography, and they acquired them because they're already pretty good and right. they want to keep them good. Right, exactly. So that's, you know, so that's the conservation goal is chemical physical stability. And how do you achieve that goal? Like, yeah, and, well, get as close as you can to it. And, and Paul, I just want to break in and say that uh, you said chemical and physical stability, whereas yeah. I said good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's why that's why it's great to interview experts. Yeah, well, great. <laughs> that's funny. Um, and so, restoration typically doesn't have anything to do with chemical or physical stability. Restoration is to restore its appearance. So typically restoration is kind of more cosmetic. And so let's say there's a tear in a photograph. Uh, so, you know, we can do, in a conservation context, there's a lot that we can do to stabilize the emulsion, to stabilize the tear so it's not going to get any worse. Then, you know, sort of the restoration steps would be, you know, how do you make, how do you make that tear as invisible as possible? You know, what are the techniques to sort of get the two sides to made up as perfectly as possible. And then if there's a little bit of paper uh, still showing along that tear, maybe adding some in-painting medium to disguise that. That's restoration. Of course, we do both as part of a normal treatment. The appearance of an object, especially in the art market, is a big deal. And so that's something that we're, we're very attuned to, both the, the, the conservation side and uh, the restoration side. I think we have to deal with it, so I'm going to bring this up. Mm -hmm. My favorite 
documentation of a fictional art restoration is from the show Seinfeld. I'm sure you're familiar with it. No, I'm not. You're not? not. Well, well, I'm going to check it out. Wait, it's that, what? It's a Seinfeld on <laughs> Yeah, the, the comedy show Seinfeld. I've never, no, I have no idea. Somebody destroys a photograph and they want to recreate it. And oh, it, it okay. leads to hilarious results, in other words. But, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm going to check it out. I'll find it. Okay. Well, I wanted to finish up here, but I wanted to finish up here in a very open-ended way. I, I wanted to ask you, Paul, I've asked you a lot of questions. You've given me some <laughs> wonderful information. What have I failed to ask you that I should have asked you? <laughs> oh. Let's see. Let me think about that for a second. And that's okay. Hurt my feelings, I, because no, no. because I want to know I want to know everything that's important. Yeah, we've really hit on the major themes. I guess what I would go back to, in terms of emphasis, is that the authentication of works of art is truly a collaborative process, and it involves really multidisciplinary teams art historians, you know, people like me who are conservators who understand the material history, scientists, you know, so no single discipline really has all the answers. And I, I feel like there is still this notion of the deep connoisseur. I know exactly I, what you're talking about. I, I, right, I buy into that. I mean, I, I buy into deep expertise garnered over many, many years of close of close study, but I definitely feel like there are limitations to connoisseurship in the authenticity arena, and I would still argue and still advocate for don't make it a, a one-stop shop just because an expert has the credentials, and, and you can look at the Lewis Hine thing, just to bring it full circle. There are many great experts in the field who were at least initially fooled by these Lewis Hine prints. So connoisseurship definitely has a role in, in understanding and interpreting photography, for sure. But I think we absolutely need to be open to other channels of information. You know, the kind of stuff, the kind of research that I'm putting out there and the research that my lab is doing at Yale. I think that the impacts of that kind of research can really be profound. And we're looking for those kind of opportunities to work with collectors to work with institutions, museums, to, to see how the tools that we're developing, the methodologies that we're developing, can help with broader interpretations, not just authenticity, but looking for patterns across an artist, across a photographer's lifetime. What do those patterns tell us? What, what can they reveal about artistic influence or regional practice, authenticity, sure, but there's a lot more. There's, Photography is, you know, we, we tend to think in the market, the art market, we tend to think of the singular print, the one great print. But, you know, that's not, that's only one aspect of photography. I mean, Lewis Hine made potentially tens of thousands of prints. What can we learn by looking at scale, at large, mm -hmm. at large scale? Right. Instead of focusing on the singular, looking across a collection. So, anyway, I, I kind of drifted in the weeds there, but... I guess that's the parting shot that I wanted to deliver. Yeah. Well, Paul, you've been a great interview. I enjoyed the heck out of it. You know, it's an amazing moment in my life, you know, a formative chapter in my life, and uh, the fact that, that you're interested in it is uh, wild. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's going to be a lot of people interested in it. Thank you. Yes, sir. You take care. See you. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.